We're going to be finishing up uh, Matthew chapter 12 this morning. We're going to be getting into, and hopefully getting through all of chapter 13, uh, and then beginning chapter 14. But before we do, uh, Brother Tim is going to lead us in a word of prayer. Brother Tim. Amen. Thanks, sir. All right. Last week, uh, we got to Matthew chapter 12, um, the, sign of the, the sign of Jonah, beginning in verse 38. So that's where we'll begin uh, on this morning. Uh, chapter 12, we'll read verses 38 through 42. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish, to see a, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment uh, with with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment and will, uh, with the judgment with this generation rather, and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Uh, these might have some issues with the slides this morning. Nope, looks like we're good. All right, so uh, <clears throat> we asked the question, what did the scribes and the Pharisees mean when they requested a sign from Jesus? And we discussed the fact that they wanted a sign different from all the signs that Christ had already done. They were blinded to the fact that these signs were from God and wanted something done that uh, they considered to be more directly from God, something they, that could not be mistaken to be from anywhere else. And we discussed the fact that everything that Jesus did could not be mistaken uh, to be from anywhere else. Yet they denied it. Yet they uh, tried to say what Jesus was doing through the power of the Spirit uh, was, was actually being done by God. They were that, uh, by the devil, rather. They were that blind. All the signs performed by Christ were directly from God. And the, on, uh, the only reason they could not see that was because they were spiritually blind and possessed rock-hard hearts. Jesus says no sign will be given except the sign of Jonah, which was the sign of his own resurrection. And this was the last point that we got to last week. And that is that Jesus said that just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the fish, so he would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. We must look at this verse uh, with the understanding that the Jews regarded part of the day as a whole day. You know, and we gave the example, if I were to fly into, you know, uh, Louisville and be there, get there Friday night and leave Sunday morning, how many days was I there? Well, I was there three days. I might not have been there, you know, three full days, but I was there Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So when, when Jesus says uh, three days and three nights, he'd be in the heart of the, of the earth, that is what he is referring to, that three days. It didn't have to be a literal 72-hour period, and we know that it wasn't uh, because, you know, he, he died at 3 o'clock and he rose in early in the morning uh, on Sunday morning. So it, was, it couldn't have been the full 72 hours. The Ninevites repented at the preaching of Jonah, And one greater than Jonah was among them. Sheba traveled a great distance to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And one greater than Solomon uh, was among them. Uh, Any comments or questions? All right, let's go on to the unclean spirit, verses uh, 43 through 45. Who is the queen of the south? What was that? Who is the queen of the south? Sheba. Yes, sir. Uh, any, any more details, you might have to enlighten us on that. Um, but I know it's Sheba, the queen of the south. All right, verses 43 through 45. When the unclean spirit had gone out from a person, it passes through waterless places, seeking rest, but finds none. Then it seeks, uh, excuse me, then it says, I'll return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds a house empty, swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the person is worse than the first. So also it will be uh, with this evil generation. 
So Jesus describes a man who had an unclean, uh, unclean spirit that left him. The unclean spirit wandered to find rest, but decided uh, to return to its former house, the original man uh, that was possessed. He finds the house in a state uh, well prepared and ex and to accept uh, the demon's return. No improvements were made to see fit that the demon could not return. And as a result, the last state is worse than the first. You know, it's like a home being broken into, uh, windows being broken and, and uh, you know, just damage being done. And, you know, just kind of cleaning up the mess, but doing nothing to prevent it from happening again. And that's exactly what happened with this demon possessed man. You know, uh, he, the, the house is described as being swept and put in order, but no improvements were made. Nothing was done to uh, keep this from happening again. Jesus is describing the current state of the Jews. In the past, Israel had been delivered from evil. And when it turned from idolatry, uh, when it turned from idolatry uh, and back to God. And now Israel rejected Jesus, the prophesied Messiah who came fulfilling all the prophecies uh, made of him. The unbelief of the current generation was proof uh, that they were more wicked uh, than ever before. You know, Jesus, again, if Jesus was what they wanted, they would have clearly accepted him. They would have accepted him no problem. But Jesus wasn't what they wanted. They wanted an earthly kingdom. They didn't want a, a, a spiritual kingdom. They didn't want the Messiah that Jesus really was and who who he came uh, who he came to be and, and uh, show the world that he was they wanted again an earthly king they wanted someone to sit on the throne of israel to basically bring them back to a position uh not under the under the romans above the romans and and in power and, and they didn't get any of that that wasn't what jesus came to do um, so they rejected him and he jesus says you know as wicked as israel was at times with their idolatrous ways He's saying that this generation is that much worse. They have the Messiah before them. They clearly see the miraculous gifts that God does through him. And they're still too blind to it. They can't see who Jesus is. They, they don't understand. They don't want to accept uh, who Jesus is. So, again, he describes it like this, this state uh, of an individual with uh, all these unclean spirits that come back. Because nothing, no improvements were made because they didn't uh, turn to God and keep their hearts and their minds focused on God. Their new situation was even worse uh, than their previous situation. Uh, any comments or questions? All right, let us close out chapter 12 and look at verses 46 through 50. <clears throat> when he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brother stood outside <clears throat> asking to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards the disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. <clears throat> so while Christ is speaking, he is interrupted with the message that his family desires to speak with him. In Christ's response, he shows that the business uh, with his family was not as important as the business he was engaging in with the people. He also displays that spiritual ties are more important than fleshly ones. You know, the people, uh, it, it comes to Jesus' attention that, hey, your family's outside. They want to speak to you. They want to talk to you. And Jesus says, you know, who's my family? Who, who is my, my mother? Who are my brothers? He says, these, those who do the will of my father are my, are my mother and sister and, bro and uh, brothers. So <clears throat> Jesus places the importance of the crowd over his own mother. And, and I want to point that out because... You know, I was just having a conversation yesterday and people elevate Mary, right? Elevate Mary to a position where she should be worshipped. She should be, uh, you know, praised. And, and a lot of denominations, a lot of people do do that. They do worship Mary. They believe that Mary is is to be worshipped, just like they believe, you know, the other apostles are, are to be worshipped. And, and all of these other saints, um, you know, saints for different things, you know, in, in Catholicism, there's a lot of different saints that have different meanings and different things tied to them. And they hold true to, hey, if you're dealing with this, this is who you need to pray to. If you're dealing with this, you need to go and, and, and talk to this individual. And people elevate <coughs> Mary to this position. And Jesus is not disrespecting his mother, but he is saying, look, she, she is a woman. She, she's, and not, not that just she's a woman, she's the, the, the ties that I have to these people spiritually, even though this is my mother, the ties that I have spiritually to those around me are more important. So, you know, I just want to point that out because, again, so many people elevate Mary to this position where Jesus didn't even stop everything that he was doing 
just to acknowledge something that his mother, his mother wanted to bring to his attention. He is saying that these spiritual ties are more important than fleshly ties in this, in this world. Those who do the will of the Father have a relationship with Christ as close and intimate as, the one, uh, as one would have with their immediate family. So when we think about our relationship with Christ, when we think about our relationship with the Father, we have to understand that it is because of Jesus that we have the ability to have this relationship, and we should treat that relationship with great importance. You know, we should, we should honor that relationship. We should elevate that relationship to the point uh, or to the, to the level that it should be. And unfortunately, a lot of times, you know, there's nothing wrong with having physical ties here and now. There's nothing wrong with being close to our family. Um, but a lot of times, family comes before the Lord in, in, many, in many cases. And a lot of times, family comes before the Lord's people. And we have to understand that these spiritual relationships are what are of great importance. Jesus says, look, he's not saying that his family is unimportant, that his mother is unimportant. But he's saying, look, these, those who do the will of my father, these are who is important. These are my, my siblings, right? My spiritual siblings. These are, are those who I have a close an intimate relationship with. Our duty to the Lord should never be sacrificed by earthly things or relationships. And unfortunately, I mean, that, that's what happens. People lose sight of the relationship that they are to have with God. They lose sight of the importance of the relationship that everyone is to have with God. And as a result, God finds himself on the back burner, right? God takes a back seat to the relationships that people do make the priority. And Jesus himself said, as we already studied, that <clears throat> father, mother, son, daughter, all of these relationships must be second. We must love all of these relationships less than we love our relationship with the Lord. Any comments or questions? All right, let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 13. We're going to look at the parable of the sower. And I recently uh, did a sermon a few weeks back. Uh, talking about the parable of the sower and the purpose of parables. So we're not going to go into as great of detail uh, as we did in that sermon, um, but we are going to make some points that I think uh, are fitting for this parable. Um, but again, we're not going to look at, at every little detail because I feel like we've talked about this and uh, I recently did a sermon on it. So the parable of the sower, Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. The same day Jesus went out, uh, went out of the house, <clears throat> and sat beside the sea, and a great crowd gathered about him, so that he got into the boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good ground and produced grain, some a hundred, uh, hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. <clears throat> so in chapter 13, it opens up with Jesus sitting at the sea with great crowds uh, gathered about him. Jesus got into a boat so that he could better, see, uh, better be seen and heard uh, by the multitudes that gathered on the shore. Again, We've talked about just the popularity of Jesus, how many instances people thronged about Jesus. They pressed in from every direction just to touch him, to be next to him, to hear him. And to avoid that and to kind of give himself uh, some distance between the, him and the crowd, not that he didn't want to be around the people, but just so, again, that he could be better heard and seen by the people, by the, by the masses, uh, he puts himself on this boat and he begins to teach uh, from the boat. And Jesus begins teaching them in parables which is an earthly story with a heavenly uh, meaning. The first parable Jesus brings to the crowd is the parable of the sower. Again, you know, you have this situation. A sower goes out to sow. Some of the seed falls on the wayside. Some, some falls on the shallow ground, the thorny ground, and eventually the good ground. And he goes on. And again, we're going to discuss a little bit of his explanation. But seeing as we've already talked about this, we're not going to get uh, in, in too much detail. But Jesus was not giving them a fun or interesting story to listen to and nothing more. Jesus wanted the crowd to hear uh, what he is saying and pay close attention to the words that he was delivering to them. He uses the, the phrase, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. He's saying, pay attention. This isn't something that, that Jesus is just saying. You know, we, we tell our kids, 
we don't, we don't talk just to hear ourselves speak, right? We talk so that the kids, our children can understand what we are saying. Our children can grasp what it is that we are telling them. And that's what Jesus is getting across here. He says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Pay attention to what I'm telling you. Pay attention to the message that I am delivering. Uh, and he goes into the purpose of the parables. Verses 10 through 17. It says, the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. So one of the purposes of the parables was to reveal that which was a mystery or unknown at the time. <clears throat> these were mysteries because they had not yet been revealed. And these were things, again, that Jesus was revealing uh, to the crowds. Both unbelievers and believers had the opportunity to hear the words of Christ. But unlike the believer, the unbeliever does not have the faith or understanding necessary to take uh, what they should from the opportunity uh, given to them. So. You know, in quoting Isaiah, Jesus talks about hearing, they never understand, seeing, they never perceive, their hearts have grown dull, they can barely hear, all of these things. Jesus is not delivering these parables and speaking in a way so that they don't understand. Jesus doesn't want them to be ignorant. He doesn't want them to be uh, in a position where they don't understand, but because of their mentality, because of where their heart is, that is why they don't understand. They're fully capable of understanding but they just don't understand because of their heart and because of their mind. You know, it's like, and this was part of, part of what we had discussed when we uh, talked about the purpose of parables. When we read something in the Bible and, and it's something that uh, we do not have a lot of insight on or something that maybe is um, not necessarily confusing, but, you know, we just don't understand what is fully being said here. If we really want to know the answer to what is being said, we can, we can search for it. We're going to look for it. You know, we have very knowledgeable brethren in our presence that we can go to and that we can ask, hey, you know, help me understand this verse a little bit better. Help me understand this parable. How, you know, so, so what I'm getting at is if we want answers, we will seek to find those answers. If we want to understand the scriptures better, then we will do what is necessary to understand the scriptures better. But for a lot of people that heard these messages that Jesus was proclaiming, they heard it and really didn't give much thought to it. You know, Jesus talks about this parable of the sower. Some of the seed uh, falls on the wayside. Some of these things, all of these things happen. And, you know, some people looked at that and just, you know, well, I don't know. I don't understand why he's talking about farming. You know, I don't understand what he means by this parable. And instead of seeking to find the answers, as the apostles do, they just chalk it up to, well, I'm not meant to understand. I I I don't need to know. This isn't really information that is important for me. When it is important, because if Jesus delivered it, then it was for a reason. Again, we don't speak just to hear ourselves talk. When we are instructing our children, there's a reason that we are giving them uh, and and saying the words to them that we are saying. Some saw miracles and heard Christ's teaching, but did not see, see them in their true light or hear them in their true meaning. And even if they did not understand, they didn't, uh, many didn't seek to pursue that knowledge. Believers who did not understand would desire to know and seek understanding and knowledge. Some would voluntarily close their eyes to the truth before them, and sin and unbelief would be the result. And I remember trying to have Bible studies with you know people that I worked with, and and, and a buddy of mine. He really stands out when I think about this situation. Um, he had questions. He knew the Bible. You know, he talked to me about um, Elisha and, and the she bear, and you know, he would talk to me about stories that aren't really you know. Noah and Moses and and all these stories that that most people know he would bring up stories that I mean to know these stories you either have to have been taught them or you have to have read them in the scriptures and he would bring these things up to me and I'm like man you know you're you're real knowledgeable you know you obviously know 
that this book is of value because you have these lessons that you're bringing to my attention. Why don't we sit down and have a study? And he didn't want to do it. He, he, he never wanted to sit down and have that study. You know, he was living a certain way. He was living a certain life. And he did not want the scriptures to alter the way he was living. He did not want to be uh, affected by the words of God. You know, as, as Paul says in Romans 1.16, you know, that Christ, the, the, the Bible, the gospel is, is power, powerful. It's, you know, it's the power unto salvation. You know, so the words of God are very powerful and they have proven themselves to be, be powerful even in our own lives. When we think about the changes that we have made and, and how we have been affected by the truth that has been revealed to us, we see that God's word does indeed have power. You know, we choose not to live a certain life that maybe we once lived and we choose to live the life that God calls us to live because God has told us to do it. If people want, if people want answers, if they want the wisdom and the understanding and the knowledge that Christ has the ability and, and has provided, then they're going to get, they're going to get it. They're going to look for it. They're going to seek it. But in a lot of cases, people don't. And they voluntarily close their eyes and their ears so that they don't have to be affected by what they hear. The disciples should have felt privileged as they were in a time where they had Christ before them. God in the flesh, an opportunity other prophets did not get. You know, when we think about great prophets like Isaiah, you know, and, and um, you know, I mean, there, there's a lot. I mean, Jeremiah, Elijah, you know, Elisha. We think about these great prophets. They were not privileged to be in a time where they were living and, and talking to and, and being among the Son of God, God in the flesh. These, these apostles, these disciples had that, that luxury to see God in the flesh, a luxury that, that not all got. So uh, they should have felt privileged to be in that position. But even then, you know, when we think about doubting Thomas in the book of John, where it says that he didn't, he didn't believe Jesus rose from the dead. And he says, you know, unless I put my hand in his, my finger in his hand and my hand in his side, I'll never believe. You know, and when he does see Jesus, Jesus shows him, he says, come, put your hand here, put your finger here. And, and when he does that, he says, you know, my Lord and my God. And, and Jesus says, blessed, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. You know, if we just look at the Bible for what it is, for what God has provided, we understand that, again, that there is great power, that this is not some message that men put together. It couldn't be. It couldn't be just something that came from the minds of men. It came from the mind of God. And we see that as there is a, there's continuity throughout the Bible. There, you know, from beginning to end, when you think about the fact that in the beginning of the Bible, man is separated from God in the tree of life. And in the end, in the book of Revelation, man is reunited with God in the tree of life. I mean, it tells one continuous story, and that is God's plan to redeem man. So we see that this has great power. We see that, uh, you know, this has an effect on those who allow it to affect them. And we have allowed God's word to affect us. Uh, and, and these individuals, obviously, they were affected by it because they were willing to give up their life for it. Right. And, and we have to be willing to do the same. But again, they were in a privileged position to have been able to see and touch and, and be around Jesus. But we are in a privileged position to know Jesus and to be known by Jesus. And that's not something that should be overlooked. We should not think that, oh, well, because I didn't see Jesus firsthand, well, I'm less off. No, God, God says that we are blessed to be in the position to where not only are we known by God, or not only do we know God, but we are also known by God. Any comments or questions? I think it's worthy to note the difference between a parable and a fable. A parable is an account that is taken from reality. Fable is something, well, a little red riding hood. Sir. Uh, and so it's, it's something that is, is taken from fantasy. <laughs> Some people, when, for instance, you get to the account of the rich man and Lazarus, they say, well, that's a parable. That's, that's not real. Well, it, it's, if, if it's a parable, it's taken from reality. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a parable, but, uh, but if, if it is a parable, it's still taken from reality. Reality. Sure. And, and all of these parables are taken from reality. They're things that, whether or not they are a real instance or not, they could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I appreciate you pointing that out because, you know, like you said, this isn't words of fantasy. You know, these aren't just uh, 
you know, things that Jesus is, you know, making up and, and, you know, don't have any ties to reality. Just like you said, even though in some of these parables they might not have happened, they could happen. And I appreciate you pointing that out. Yes, sir. Whenever you think about any, anything we learn in life, anything we learn in education, I think Jesus uh, is understanding the fact that we're all human and human nature is we don't really get it the first time. Mm -hmm. Let's say, for instance, you are taking a college class or a class in high school, no matter what it is, Teacher, professor, just lectures, 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 without giving any examples. You know, to me, it's like <clears throat> the parables allow us to understand a little more deeply. Just like in education, you, you have examples to go along with the theory, and it really helps the, the human mind to grasp that concept. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, the fact that Jesus has given us something to tie these things that he is teaching to, you know, those examples. Because like you said, I mean, Without examples, it definitely makes, it, with examples, it makes understanding easier and, and, uh, holding, and holding on to gra and grasping things uh, easier as well. So I appreciate that. Brother Joe. I know uh, Jesus has already been using parables in his, in his work before now, but it, uh, it kind of sounds like from going from chapter 12 to chapter 13, this, this instance of him giving uh, teaching in the form of parables to this great crowd happens same day that uh, the Pharisees and teachers of the law accused him of casting out demons by the power of, of uh, Satan. And, they, and then they ask him, oh, well, give us a sign and we'll believe, and he pronounces you know, judgment on them. And then now, uh, it, I think it's kind of significant, you know, not that he uses parables right after this, but he tells his disciples, this is why I'm using parables. Mm -hmm. Because the people that should get it don't want to get it. Yes, sir. And so I'm going to teach, I'm going to also teach this way. But I, I think it's a, uh, another form of judgment against the religious leaders of this day. But uh, if we're not careful, we can fall under the same condemnation as they are. We're no better than they were, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were back then. Mm -hmm. If we're not careful how we uh, take God's word. Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, because we can fall into that same position and. Uh, you know, that same idea that what we believe is right, you know, and that was the problem with the scribes and the Pharisees is it didn't matter what Jesus said because their mentality was, hey, what I what I believe, that's true. And, uh, you know, as Brother Joe said, if we're not careful, we can fall into that that same that same position where, you know, we're just we convince ourselves that what we believe is true and therefore. It is true. It must be true. It has to be true. I think that's why it's so significant that he brings against them uh, Nineveh and uh, Queen of Sheba. Mm -hmm. They came in not having any preconceptions or real knowledge about who the true God of the universe was. And when Jonah preached to them, they got it. Yes, sir. They did something about it. She, the Queen of Sheba had heard about the wisdom and uh, understood that probably it was associated with the God of Israel. And when she came to hear it and, uh, and did hear it and understood it, she made a great, she made a proclamation to Solomon about how great it was that his God had given him such wisdom to understand how great his God was. Mm -hmm. These people, want, the people Jesus was talking to, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law should have got that and they didn't want anything to do with it. Yes, sir. Those who should get it didn't get it, you know, and I think that speaks to us as Christians, you know, us as Christians who have given our life to God. We should get the, the understanding and, and the importance of living a life for God and not just, uh, you know, having the mindset that, you know, we can, we can go about our lives however we want to live it and by our own guidance. And, and we should understand, of, of, of all people, we should be the ones to understand that our ways should be guided by God's ways. Our thoughts should be guided by God's thoughts. And a failure to do that is a failure to be pleasing to God. When we, when we elevate our thoughts, our ways, as the scribes and the Pharisees elevated their thoughts and their ways above the teachings of God, they were put in a position where, you know, it was not going to be spiritually beneficial to them. And as you pointed out, uh, while the parables were given so that those who did not want to understand wouldn't understand, 
that didn't mean that the parables were automatically understood by his disciples. They mm -hmm. came and asked him, yes, sir. explain this to us. And that's what uh, we would do or we should do anytime, and you pointed that out, but we, we should be willing to ask for clarification, to seek help. And, and uh, that's, what, that's what someone who wants to understand will do. Yes, sir. Yeah, not, not being so proud that, you know, we can't, we can't learn from someone else, you know. Um, I know that you had talked about it in, our, uh, in the uh, Proverbs class, you know, where we talked about uh, Proverbs chapter 27, about iron sharpening iron, you know, that's what, that's what we're supposed to do. You know, we're supposed to sharpen each other. You know, we'll sit and study and I'll be learning from you and, you know, it's, it's, encouraging that, hey, I, I can say something that is encouraging to you or, you know, that, that maybe helps you seeing it from a different perspective. And that's the beauty of Bible study. You know, that's the beauty of, you know, even, even in, in Bible class, having these conversations, having these interactions. You know, all of us have different minds. We all have different points of views. We all look at the same truth, the same one truth that we can read. But when we have other minds that are engaging, it helps all of us to understand a little bit better. You know, when all of us are, are pointing out certain things or, or someone says something, you know, it helps us look at things from a different perspective, which is great. You know, uh, I tell Arlene that all the time. You know, Arlene will come to me with questions or, you know, we'll have a study and, and uh, she'll point out something at a verse. And I'm like, hey, you know, I didn't think about it that way. You know, I'm glad you, I'm glad you pointed that out. And that happens here. You know, the, even the points that have been made today, they, they should be points that, that we are all, uh, you know, just, just taking in and absorbing, knowing that all of these help us understand the bigger picture and understand what is being said that much better. So I, I appreciate that. Any other comments or questions? When Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, and sometimes if you don't realize that you're lost, you're, you're not going to seek it. Yes, sir. And that was the case of, of many in, in his day and time. But they just said, well, we, we really don't need it, so why would I listen to it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, why, why, why fix something if it's not broken, right? right? If you're in a position where, hey, we're already right with God, we are, we, we are God's people you know, God, cho God could have chose anyone. He chose us, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We are that people. So we already have God. We don't need to pursue him any closer. You know, again, that's a mentality that we as Christians can't fall into. Because we have a relationship with Christ, we can't fall into the mentality that I don't need to pursue a closer relationship. You know, people in the world, they don't have a relationship with God. I at least have a relationship with God. I don't need that relationship to be any better. Well, if we don't improve that relationship and if we don't grow closer to God, Satan is going to pull us further and further away from him. So that constant desire to grow closer to, to our Lord is necessary. Great points. Any, comments or, any more comments or questions? All right. Let us look at verses uh, 18 through 23. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches it away. <clears throat> it uh, snatches away what has been sown in the heart. This is what is sown along the path. As for what is sown on the rocky ground, uh, this is one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation and persecution arise on account of the word, immediately he falls away. And uh, for the one who, sow, who is sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke it out, and it proves unfruitful. As for the one who is sown, uh, excuse me, as for what is sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it and indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, <coughs> excuse me, and in another thirty. The soil represents different hearts that receive the seed or the word sown in them. The wayside heart does not take the seed at all. The shallow heart does not have roots, uh, so the seed dies. The thorny heart uh, the thorny heart has the word cho choked out by the cares of the world. Uh, and again, we, like, like I said, we went into detail on this um, in, in that sermon, the purpose of parables. Uh, so again, we're not going to go further into detail on it. Um, if someone has any comments or questions, that's welcome. But this is all we're going to look at uh, uh, in regard to these verses. The good heart receives the word and obeys it. Now, there are some points about the good heart that, that I, I'd like to make at this time. The good heart is different from the wayside heart in that it understands the word and the importance of it and does not allow Satan to take it away. You know, that wayside heart is one where the seed is sown and immediately, you know, the birds come and devour it, right? Immediately Satan snatches it from them. 
People think, oh, this is not of any importance. Uh, I, don't, I don't need this. It goes to that idea, you know, why fix what's not broken? I don't need a relationship. So the seed falls on the wayside heart. Um, but the good heart is better in that way. The good heart is different from the shallow heart in that instead of being overcome and defeated by tribulation, it looks to the very word it received, the very seed it received, to overcome and defeat uh, the trials and tribulation. The good heart is different from the thorny heart in that it does not allow anything to be of greater importance than the word and looks to it in order to keep from being deceived. You know, that wayside heart, uh, excuse me, the, the thorny heart is deceived into thinking the, the things of this world are of greater importance. The, the shallow heart uh, believes that, uh, you know, well, it, it doesn't believe because it does not have depth. It does not have any root so that it can believe. Uh, and, and the good heart is different in all of these ways. Only the good heart bears any fruit. The wayside heart, the shallow heart, the thorny heart, all of these don't bear fruit. Only the good heart is described as bearing fruit. And in different ways, you know, not everyone is going to do, do, do the same work, right? I mean, when we think about, which we're going to get to later on down the road, uh, in Matthew chapter 25, I believe, where it talks about uh, the parable of the talents. You know, one individual received five, another two, and another one, each according to his ability. And the one who received five talents and made ten was told the same thing to the one who received two talents and made four. Well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, so we might not all be doing the same thing, but if we are doing what God has expected of us, what God knows that we are able to do, that he is pleased with. Any comments or questions? All right, that brings us to the parable of the wheat, uh, the wheat and the tares, also described as the parable of the weeds. Um, just for the sake of not breaking these up, we're going to look uh, at verses 24 through 30 and also 36 through 43 and read the parable as well as uh, the Lord's explanation. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weed among, uh, weeds among the tares, and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go out and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them into bundles and burn them, uh, bind them into bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Dropping down to verse 36. And he left the crowds and went into the house and the disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who, sow, who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is, at, is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of the kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw, uh, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. All right, so it is likely that the practice Jesus describes of sowing weeds in someone else's field was something common uh, in the days of Christ. Someone just going and you have this field, good, good grain, good uh, product that has been sown, just sowing, sowing a, you know, just, just weeds or um, you know, just a tear would be a poisonous plant that looks like wheat. Um, but doing, doing this, and it's just, we can all understand that that's just, wrong. We can see the evil in, in doing such a thing. So whether it was something that these people were familiar with or not, they could certainly see the great evil uh, in doing such an act. This parable and the parable of the sower are the only two parables Jesus gives further detail and explanation on. And as Brother Ron pointed out, these were things that they wanted more information on. Explain to us the parable of the tares. Explain to us the parable of the sower. Explain to us what these things mean. So perhaps the others were simple enough that they could not be misunderstood. That does not mean that seeking the appropriate meaning wasn't necessary. Uh, when we look at the other parables, it's not saying that these parables were, uh, you know, we, we, we shouldn't, we kind of just take them for what we think, take them for what we want. No, we, if we, we need to understand these as well. But the parable of the sower, the parable of the tares uh, may have been a little bit more difficult. So Jesus goes 
uh, and, and provides the answer that the disciples were looking for, giving further explanation. The field in which the seeds uh, were sown represents the world. Jesus is the man that sowed the good seed. Satan is the enemy who sowed the tares or the bad seed. The wheat represents Christians. The tares represent those who have not yet uh, come to Christ. The harvest is the end of the world. The reapers who gather the good seed and the tares are the angels. The wheat will be gathered into the Lord's barn. The tares will be gathered and burned. The tares are described as having offended God. This because of their willingness and desire to practice iniquity. So we see that these, you know, the wheat and the tares, the, the result of the wheat is being gathered into the barn. The result of the tares is being collected and burned. And, and the reason that that is, is because, you know, again, they, they were offensive to God because they, des- they willingly and desired to practice iniquity. They, wa- they wanted to practice and live uh, sinful and ungodly lives. The fate of the wicked is eternal punishment in hell. Both the field and the kingdom represent the world. And the reason that I put that is because when we look at uh, the parable, it says uh, in verse 37, um, actually I lost the spot, but anyway, where it talks about the world, uh, the field being the world, um, is talking about, again, the world. And when it talks about the kingdom, uh, it's talking about that world as well, that that. The angels will go through the kingdom and gather that which is offensive and collect it and gather the, the wheat and, and put it in the barn. In this, in this uh, instance, both of these are referring and representing the world. In his explanation, Jesus does not explain uh, the meaning of him refusing the servants to uproot the tares and remove them from the field. So we've discussed before how, uh, you know, when something bad happens, people will be quick to blame God, just as these individuals, these servants were quick, quick to blame the master, the owner of the field. When they see that the tares had come up, they say, Master, didn't you sow good seed? You know, what did you do wrong? And then the master says, an enemy has done this. And then their response is, do you want us to go and uproot some of the, uh, uproot these tares, uproot these weeds? And he says, no, lest in you uprooting some of the tares, you uproot the wheat along with it. Let let both grow together and at the harvest, we'll make that separation. Um, In his explanation, again, Jesus doesn't, given detail uh, what this means or explain what he meant by these uh, by these verses. So I believe the reason the Lord told the servants to allow them to both grow up uh, together is to allow an opportunity for some of the tares to become wheat. Uh, Wheat and tares look very similar and to prevent some of what uh, what would be wheat from being removed and destroyed. God's patience leads to their salvation. So again, a tear and a and a and wheat. uh, These are both plants that look very similar. And Jesus says, you know, leave them alone. And this is my belief. This is what I I believe uh, this to be uh, the meaning of this. You know, that when we think about if Jesus would have came 10 years ago, how many of us would have been saved? If he would have made that separation and took the tares and cast them out, how many of us would have been saved? If he would have done it five years ago, 50 years ago, 20 years ago, how many of us would be saved? I mean, his patience allows opportunity for the tares, for those who do not yet have a relationship with Christ, to come to have that relationship with Christ. So that's what I believe it to me. Brother Gig. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I appreciate you pointing that out. That was something. Yeah, yeah, that was something that I had read. Um, You know, obviously, you'd probably be more familiar with, you know, just just I mean, being in the area where you have, you know, good soil and you can plant and do these things. Um, that was something that I had read. And I appreciate you pointing that out, that in uprooting the weeds, you can affect the soil that the, that the wheat is in as well. Um, so to present to prevent all of that from happening, uh, you know, Jesus says, let them be, leave them alone. And at the harvest, that separation will be made. So because God is so patient and because he has not yet come. We should be grateful because people in the world have the opportunity to come to God and we have the opportunity to glorify God in the way that we choose to live our lives. The wheat, having accepted and submitted to the, uh, to the reign of Christ in their lives, will shine forth as the sun, describing the glory uh, that shall be with the saints in his resurrection. Any comments or questions? I wanted us to get through 13, um, but... 
We're going to have to do that on next week and, uh, and get into chapter 14. So I thank you so much for your comments and questions. I thank you for your time and attention. We'll pick up here on next week.